Executive Director of the Auburn Marshburn Public Schools Foundation, um, associated with Marshburn Rural High School, that's our high school in our district, 437, and we'd like to welcome you all. We have 700 high school students here today, so overwhelming. Dr. Farley and Julie Mazacek, Julie's the Vice President for Academic Affairs, for hosting this. As I was starting to coordinate this, I thought, well, you know, because we're way out in southwest Topeka, I wanted to get it closer centralized for everybody, and they were gracious enough to open this up for us and, and do all the setup, so we really appreciate that. We'd also again like to thank Gills, you'll see their logo back here. Uh, they were the sponsor of this. And this was originally scheduled for February, and we got iced out, and um, in fact, the reason I scheduled it for last February is February is Black History Month. And then I told John when we arrived back to the airport after it got canceled, I said I apologize for scheduling this in February. Didn't even think about the weather. I was concerned about Black History Month. John said, every month is Black History Month to me. In fact, when I picked up John from KCI yesterday, we walked outside and saw the, the rain coming down and he said, this isn't going to turn into ice, is it? <laughs> I promised him no, but uh, but Hills wasn't able to be here today, uh, but John got to visit with them in his first visit here, so we want to thank Hills for their sponsorship. also like to thank Patrick Early. Patrick Early is the, uh, the head of communications uh, and public relations at Washburn, and he was very instrumental in helping put this all together. Uh, the, the reason we've got John Carlos here, I worked at Washburn, as Dr. Farley said, many years, born and raised in Leftworth, Kansas, and uh, worked in this area a long time. Then I had the opportunity to go to San Jose State. I did fundraising at San Jose State University for the athletic program. While I was out there, Dr. Carlos was going to be enshrined into the Bay Area Sports Hall of Fame, which is a very special Hall of Fame. If you Google it and look it up and see the members of that very prestigious group. And the athletic department said, would you serve as the host for John while John is in town? And I said, I'd be honored. John and I had many meals together and had a lot of visits, and we became fast friends. We've stayed in touch. John lives in the Atlanta area now, and of course I'm here, and, um, and we've stayed in touch. And I said, I've got to get John back here to speak, because I've heard him speak many times uh, in the Bay Area, and I thought, I've got to get him back to share the street with you all. John ran track at San Jose State. He set many NCAA records, uh, track meet records, world records. He was a sprinter. In the indoor, he would run the 60, the 100, the 200. Um, he would also run on the 4x4 relay. And, um, and then, of course, as you know, in between his junior and senior year at San Jose State, he ran in the 68 Olympics. And we'll get into that uh, in a little bit. Also, I'm going to set the stage. The, the day was October 16, 1968. So this coming October 16th, in about a month from now, is the 50th anniversary of that race. And if you remember, you, you younger people don't, but if you look in, in the history, 1968 was a very turbulent year. Uh, the Vietnam War was going on, and there were protests against the war all throughout the United States. Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, was assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee on April 4th of 68, at the age of 39. King's assassination set off riots in major cities across the country. Uh, presidential candidate Bobby Kennedy was assassinated in Los Angeles on June 5th of that year at age 42. One highlight note of that 1968, on September 9th of 1968, Arthur Ashe became the first black tennis player to win a Grand Slam tennis tournament, winning the U.S. Open. Ironically, going up to 2008, John Carlos and Tommy Smith received the Arthur Ashe Courage Award the, at the ESPYs in 2008. Uh, today we're going to learn a lot about John, his background, and what led up to the, uh, uh, we're going to show the race after a while, we're going to show the medal presentation and talk about that. John's model has always been, we live to make history. So please help me welcome the world's fastest humanitarian, Dr. John Carlos. <laughs>
tell us about growing up in Harlem and also tell us about how you ended up getting into track and field, because I know it wasn't your first passion. No, uh, as a youngster growing up in Harlem, man, I was wide eyed and quick to adjust to the situation. As a youngster, I was looking to fill voids in my young mind in terms of why things were the way they were. How can we make things better at a very young age? Uh, I was fortunate to have a mother and father in my household. When, when I paid out from my house, many of my friends didn't have a mother and father. Most of them had a mother and father was missing in action. I realized that fathers were missing in action due to drugs that was put upon them. Let me tell you, you can take a drug and put it in a certain location and no one can go near I wouldn't care to go near it. But then you can put drugs in that same location and other people will approach that drug based on the standard of life that they had. I was trying to find boys as a young individual and I used to go to junkies. My father used to tell me, I don't want you running with those junkies. I don't want you hanging out with them. But I had a purpose to hang out with them because I had need to find out why would you use drugs? Why are you going to drugs? And I worried these guys so much until one of them said to me one day, he said, do you really want to know why we use these drugs? I said, man, that's why I keep asking. He said, have you ever had a girlfriend that you liked so much, but you were afraid to approach her because you didn't think you was qualified enough to be her man? I said, yeah. He said, well, look, man, I had the same situation. I had this girl that took me a long time to approach her. But when I did, I find that she was watching me as much as I was watching her. He said, then I got the courage to ask her one day to be my bride. He said, and when she said yes, automatically it came over me that I was going to be the best husband, the best father, the best breadwinner. I'm going to be the captain of the ship. He said, then... As we got married, we began to have kids. Then I realized that every point that I made that I was going to be the best at, someone was blocking me from being that father. Someone was blocking me from being that husband. Someone was blocking me from being that breadwinner. I couldn't get a decent job because they told me I wasn't qualified. And then if I did get a chance to go to school, they told me I was overqualified. They say, you know, it's one thing when you are a good father and your daughter come home and say, Daddy, you promised me that you was going to buy me that dress for my birthday. And you feel confident that you're going to buy that dress when you made that commitment to her. But when she reminds you that you walk down the hall and you take your hand and put it in your pocket and you got nothing in your pocket but holes. Before you can digest that, here comes your son and say, Daddy, my PE teacher said, if I don't have some tennis shoes tomorrow, I'm going to fail PE. You walk down the hall and you put your hand in the other pocket, you got bigger holes. And now before you can digest that, here comes your wife say, honey, you know, we've been married for 15 years now. Our anniversary is next week. What are we going to do? You can't even buy our robes. So he said, man, you know, all that time I used to go to the mirror in the morning and brush my teeth and wash my face and fix my hair, but I never really got in touch with the man in the mirror. And one day I looked up at the guy in the mirror. And I found that I didn't like that guy. My question is, the youngster is, how do you not like yourself? He said, because I couldn't be the man that God may be intended for me to be. He said, so now I'm looking for escapism. And anyone ever seen an old movie that came out called Lady Saints the Blues? Yeah. And you saw this woman named uh, Billie Holiday, where she was riding through the south and she saw the KKK having a little witch hunt. He said, and then someone told us, said, Billy, I know you're distraught, but the show must go on. Take this little package here to help you get through the night. And she took the package, as well as all of those fathers that was in my community who took that package, thinking it was a one-night deal. But they've been missing in action now for 70 years. Because those fathers that took those drugs never came back. So when you see kids in the inner city, those kids, they growing up with no followers. The boom box is raising them. The dope in the street is raising them. The lack of understanding in school systems around this country is raising them. And most, the most indignant thing about them is they don't have a clue as to who the man in the mirror is. 
So when I was coming through Harlem, I looked at all of that at a very young age, and I realized that although I had, my father was a cobbler or a shoemaker, my mother came here as an immigrant from Cuba. I told my mother, I said, Mom, if you can go in and clean abortion offices, you can be a doctor. I'm a little boy telling my mother this. When she went to school, she became a nurse. My father was still fixing shoes. So we had bread in the cabinet. We had clothes in the closet, even though I had to wait until my brother and I grew something before I could put it on. <laughs> but we had it. But then when I paid out to check my buddies out, they didn't have no food in the cabinet. We didn't have a fridge, we had an ice box. They didn't even have ice for the box, much more food. They didn't have no clothes in the cabinet, only clothes they had was clothes they had on their back. And then I looked at this little fish tank TV. And I saw a guy on there with a funny looking outfit, some tights, a funny looking hat. And I checked this guy out because he was different. And when I realized that this guy here was my hero on television, I didn't get turned on to the Mickey Mouse gang and the rest of them programs that was on TV. I got turned on to this guy, and I found that his name was Robin Hood. Robin Hood was the type of guy that said, hey man, I'm not concerned about the sheriff of Nottingham, I'm not concerned about the king, I'm concerned about those that's less fortunate. So I thought about Robin Hood in Nottingham Forest, and man, if the king's men come through, they got to pay a tariff because this is my forest. <laughs> well, I felt like all of those subjects in my community didn't have. It was somebody's responsibility, and when all the dust settled, the responsibility came to me to see that they had an opportunity to live a life and to prosper too. Only way you can live a life and feel good is that you go to school and you don't have to worry about whether you're going to be able to spell the words that they want you to spell because you will be drowned out because your stomach is saying, feed me. Because you had a situation where so much friction in your house at night because you, mom and dad, is having bad times and it's creating friction and you can't focus on your education because trauma is going on in your house. So I took it upon myself to say, well, if they're bringing freight trains into my neighborhood, this is my forest. They got to pay a tariff. So I got my merry men. We would go over to the freight trains and I would break those locks. Now some people say I was stealing. But then God said, you're doing a mission. For me, everybody don't understand the mission when you first start. And I'm walking in the freight trains and I look to see what they had in there. And I remember my partner's telling me, said, man, we gonna have fat pockets. And I told him, I said, no, nah, man, this ain't about our pockets. This is about people that don't have, and I said, well, you guys don't have nothing in your house. So we gonna get some food for your house and we gonna feed people that don't have it. I'm 13, 12 years old doing this. And I used to always take the food and give it to the people in the neighborhood and I tell them one thing, whatever you do, don't mention it to my father. Don't even let him get back to my father, because my father didn't say. He brought us up to be right and righteous and upstanding. I hit those freight trains, and God turned me on to so much pride to that. You talk about that picture right there? When I was seven, eight years old, believe it or not, God chose to give me a vision of that demonstration right there. Only difference is, Tommy Smith wasn't in the picture, Peter Norman wasn't in the picture, and I was seven, eight years old, standing in a box in a farm, people were sitting in the stands just like you. I didn't know what the stadium was. And all of us applaud vigorously. It took a minute because I'm a little boy that dawned on me. They must be applauded by me because I'm the only one out here on this box. And you know, as a little kid, you go to wave, and you go to wave as high as you can wave. And I got my hand up just about where you see it in this picture up here, and it froze in time. And why it froze in time? Because instantaneously, all the individuals that was applauding, it's like somebody hit the light switch, and the applause turned to anger and venom. And it scared me. And I went to dinner that night, and vision happened that morning, but I went to dinner that night. My father knew that I was destroyed. He said, Johnny, what's the matter? I said, Daddy, I was in a movie. You was in a movie? I said, yeah. And then he went on back and he said, what happened? I said, Daddy, everybody was happy about something I did. And then they got mad at me. And they started throwing things at me. And talking about me and calling me names. 
My father brought me to his rib cage and he said, son, don't worry about that. He said, my job is to love you, protect you, house you, feed you, and see if you get good education. There ain't nobody going to bother you. And I went on from there and thinking when I went into the freight train, I wanted to give those kids the same opportunity that my father gave me because I know that they didn't have that in the neighborhood. But then they had the sheriff, or uh, the popo, <laughs> the police. They saw that those freight trains were being hit. And they would run and catch us and always, always think about because most of the police when I was a kid was Irish cops. A lot of them were short and stubby. Big belt buckle, big gun, but they can run. They can <laughs> run. They can run. <laughs> they catch all my buddies and they have them against the wall, but I would always seem to get away. And I stand in the crowd, what did they do? Why are you bothering them? And my boys would turn around off the wall and look and say, he got away again. <laughs> but it was two detectives in my neighborhood, Mr. Lester and Mr. Bryant. When Mr. Lester and Mr. Bryan knew my father, they went to my father and said, Earl, there's it been some breakers in the freight yards and you need to tell Johnny. And my father stopped him and he said, that's your job. You need to tell him. And I was over there at McCoon's Park, right across the street from where the old Yankee Stadium was. And they served the whole park, put police cars out there to make sure we couldn't get out. And they came in and they found me and they told my buddy, y'all go sit up against the fence. And they said, there's two things we need to tell you. Now, Mr. Lester was about 5'11", 6 feet. Mr. Brown was 6'6". Six, six. Big red bone, big hands. And he said, go on, Mr. Lester, tell him. And Mr. Lester said, there's been some break-ins at the freight yards. We think we know who's doing it. We can't do anything to him until we catch him. And then he took his nose and he pushed his nose up against mine and telling me, and we're going to catch him. In other words, you better slow your roll. <laughs> Mr. Brad said, go on, Mr. Lester, tell me other thing. He said, oh, yeah, you have a talent. What talent is that? He said, you're a runner. And I kind of <laughs> smirked. And Mr. Brian smacked me here, and his fingers landed here. <laughs> Don't you ever disrespect Mr. Lester. I'm not disrespecting Mr. Lester. He said, listen, this man has something to tell you. And he said, you're a runner. I said, Mr. Lester, I'm not disrespecting him. I said, you know, everybody in the neighborhood is a runner. And I said that in the thought that my mother, when my mother got that job as a nurse at Bellevue Hospital, she gave her one night for my dad to go make a little extra money. She used to get up at 10 o'clock at night, go to work. And this particular night, she got up and she came back about 20 minutes later with her stockings all torn up, her legs bleeding. And we said, what happened, Mom? What happened? Somebody snatched my purse because that was a thing for kids back in that time, snatched a woman's purse and run. They snatched my purse from my brothers, my father, we was all a little upset. We going to find this individual. My mother said, nah, everything is good. All I need to do is get some material gone. That's insecticide, but you guys don't know what material gone, y'all don't know that. But she said, all I need to do is do that, clean up the wound, I'll be all right. And we said, no, nah, we're going to find this guy. We're going to get your purse back. She said, no, nah, you don't need to do that. And my father said, why, why? And she said, because I got my purse back. <laughs> How you get your purse back? And she said, I ran him down. <laughs> so when she said that, that stayed with me. So I'm telling Mr. Bryan, I'm not disrespecting everybody's opponent. Specifically talking about my mother. And that's how I got my career started in the track and field. Not because I wanted to show anybody how fast I was. But God gave me a gift like every one of this audience right now. God gave me a basket and he got gifts inside. Everybody's got a talent. Whether you believe it or not, everybody's got a talent. I looked at my gifts. My gifts were first of all, when I went to school, I went through school. I didn't go to school. School didn't have no value to me. I've never seen nobody who was the bike president. I've never seen the IBM or CEOs next door to me. So what value did school have for me? The name of the game was to get out there and hustle your money. Who's good at that? And then one day, I had a situation in school. Chuck, I know I'm going off script, but I got to let them know this before you get off script. <laughs> all you guys up there in the back that's going to college, and for all you youngsters down here in the front that's looking to go to college, Think about me, they call me Dr. John now. 
You know what they used to do to me? They used to have me in school and they would take me and put me on a stool and they put a pointed hat on my head and they would write dummy down the front. And everybody would come in the classroom before they look at the teacher and look at the class, they look to see who the dummy today is. That was me. What that I was dumb is just that I didn't see no interest in school and at the same time I had learning disabilities. I was dyslexic, but they didn't say you was this anything, you just this dummy. Okay? So now, while I'm in school, I have this teacher named Miss Seneca. God bless Miss Seneca. She was a geography teacher. And she used to always call me and say, Johnny Carlos, come up to the front. They used to have a long stick or pointer, they used to call it black tip. And she would stand on the board, she would give me this pointer. Say, John, show me in England. I'll stand there. Show me the United States. I'll stand there. Show me France. I'll stand there. And then she said, go sit down. Next morning, she was right back at it again. The next day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, I'm high. Let's look down the chair like that. So I don't want to see you, but she would come walk right next to my desk and call up to the room. So I get up there this last time and I said to Miss Seneca, I said, why are you always bring me up here? Are you trying to embarrass me? Why are you doing this? She said, well, I have a question for you. I said, what's that? She said, simply, are you God? My lip drop, and my God, where that come from? <laughs> no, I'm not God. She said, I know you're not God. I said, why is that? She said, because God told me to get you ready for where you're going. All right. None of us know where we're going, but all of us should be prepared for what we get there. So now, I don't understand what she was saying. And I remember all the kids in the class used to snicker, because, oh, little dumb Johnny, he don't know this and he don't know that. And I remember one time they brought the Mona Lisa to the United States. And they had this enormous crate. The crate was as big as this auditorium here. And I went to Rome through his big feet running track. And I'm standing probably with my man sitting at the end with his hat there. I'm standing there and the Mona Lisa is right there. And I'm standing leaning up against the wall looking at this picture and I'm blown away, first of all, because the picture was no bigger than this, but they had a crate bigger than this building. <laughs> Made me understand how valuable the picture was. But then I started thinking about all of those individuals that was left. I wonder how many of them would ever have an opportunity to be this close to the Mona Lisa. Yeah, yeah. So you don't know where you're going. You don't know what gifts you have until you start taking note as to who you are. Because remember, we are connected here. Every one of us are connected, whether you believe it or not. If one of you guys walk down the street and you say, man, I'm a Protestant, or I'm a Baptist, or I'm a Muslim, it don't matter. If you're walking down the street and you fall out because you can't get no oxygen, you're not going to ask them what's your religion. You ain't going to ask them what your ethnic background is. All you're going to ask them, do you have enough oxygen in you that you can let me some? Why? Because I want to live. It's all about... Hey guys, you know, I'm normally, I wouldn't say this to you, but I have to say it. Okay? My wife get upset every time I say it, but I say it, and, and I say it from my heart, and no malice toward you. I don't like applause. Oh. And the reason why I don't like applause is because I'm not here giving you a song and a dance. I would love to be a singer, but God didn't make me a singer. Okay? <laughs> applause, I want to be the one to sit back and applaud you for you stepping up the plate and do what you need to do to make this a better society for all of us. You understand? So let's get a message out of this that everybody can take some home or wrap it and say, let's put this on the dining room table, mom and dad, let's have this discussion. But don't look for applause from me. Let me give you the applause. Because I'm getting ready to step out of this game that I'm in, and it's time for you to step into the game. Right. That's why God sent me back to Topeka, not once, but twice. She chucked and he did it, but God did it. God said, I just want you to see the church and digest the people so when you come back, you can give them what they need. That's why I'm here the second time, to give you what you need. So, in, in essence, what I said from God taking me from that vision as a little kid, seven or eight years old, to turn into Robin Hood 
at 12 years old to begin to look at what God gave me in terms of athletics. I didn't look at athletics and say, I want to run track so I can point to myself and say, look how great I am. I looked at the ability that God gave me and realized that I can use this as a springboard into life. I want to be a representative of righteousness. Well, how are you going to be a representative of righteousness if nobody knows you? So then I realized that this gift that God made me, gave me in track and field, I realized that God gave everybody a gift, but he said, man, I ain't going to give it all to you. You got to work for some. So then my job was to perfect the gift that he gave me. If I'm going to use this as a springboard to be a voice, I have to be the best. Because if I wasn't the best, people ain't going to pay attention to nothing I have to say. So then I started training. And I started training with a desire now. Train to help someone. I can always come up off of the theory that I had as a little kid in my neighborhood, because my neighborhood was born about each one teach one. So if I can get a hold of somebody in track and field that wasn't as good as me, but give him the sense that he is as good as me, because I'll be in a race and I'll be out and I ease off. They come up and they let them go ahead. And I might ease back up, but I'll let them win. And people know me say, man, why you let that guy win the race? I said, man, think about this. If I let him win the race, that inflated his mind so much that he feel like he did it. And it's going to make him be able to run that next race so much more relaxed and so much more confident. Now, when he has this much confidence and ability going for him, what does that do for me? That's going to make me have to really dig deep to find out how good I really am. But in essence, I helped him to be a better individual on the track. That's what life is about trying to raise somebody up to be better than they were yesterday. That's why my motto is, we live to make history. That crosses every color line, that crosses every religion, that crosses every economic base that you have or you don't have. You don't have to be rich to be famous. You can be the poorest person on the planet and be as famous. People look at me and they say, well, you know, John, you did a lot of good things back in the day, but you don't have no money to show for. I said, yeah, I've seen a lot of people that did a lot of bad things, and they got all the money, but they can never have enough money to buy what God gave me. <laughs> Think about what I just said. They got people that got plenty of money, and they give all their money if they can be me for a day. Be yourself, or be yourself for the right reasons. And you will get rewards, whether you want them or not. I was telling Chuck as a young girl when I was teaching my class, a young girl came in one day and she was distraught. I don't want to be bothered. Don't talk to me. I said, hey, baby girl, calm down. I said, ain't that bad. I said, I love you. I don't need your love. I don't want your love. Who are you to tell me you love me? I said to her, I said, well, listen, baby girl, I gave you my love. You can't give it back to me. All you can do is roll around and figure out what it's all about and then give it to somebody else, but you can't give it back to me. Because God has given it away. Years go by, I see this little girl on the road, standing out there with her two little babies. I didn't know who she was, and I drive by, and she's hollering, Mr. Carlos, Mr. Carlos. I turn my car around thinking she wanted to ride. I said, yeah, that girl, you need to ride. She said, no, I don't want to ride, Mr. Carlos. I'm just so happy to see you. Do you remember me? No, I don't remember you, baby girl, help me. You remember you told me about you love me? I said, you that little girl? She said, yes, I am. She said, you see my daughter? And she was excited to tell the daughter, say, you know, the man I'm telling you about, Mr. Carlos, this is Mr. Carlos. And I'm looking at the girl, and I'm looking at her daughters, and she said, you see how my daughters are? And her daughters are very polite, real sharp. She said, my kids are like that because you took the time to show me what we're loving all about. Understand? She wasn't a black girl. She was a white kid. There's another white kid who sent me an email or text the other day, and I looked at the text and she said, Mr. Carlos, I was in your ISS class for one day and you changed my life. So when someone tells you that, you gotta say, let me go and give an overview as to who this person is. I need to see a picture. I hit there. Jump up, I see the little girl, 
Now remember a distinct, her mother and father were racist. I mean, total racist. When she came to my class this particular day and she was so distraught about her parents being who they were. And she didn't know how to handle it. And I told her, I said, well, listen, you know, in a situation like, like that, you have to separate yourself and become independent. You have to become an independent being to understand who you are, understand your values and your morals. I say, when you understand who you are and realize the strengths that you have, then you can go back and try and nurture your mom and dad and show them their ills. And the girl said to me, she said, Mr. God, you think that'll work? I said, I know it'll work. I say, you know, some people, you know, have to think about, oh, I'm gonna go home and I'm gonna raise hell, or I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna burn the house down, I'm gonna do this. Say, I don't believe in violence. I believe if I need to get somebody, I don't need no gun to go get them, I can go get them with this. But that's the best way to educate individuals is to understand and love and <coughs> perseverance. You have to have endurance to deal with people to change their minds. I've been on this fight on this road for 50 years. Remember when I started out, I started out as a little kid, 70 years old, when God showed me something I didn't even understand what he showed me. I thought about black kids in my neighborhood that came up and thought about how I was gonna be public enemy number one. And when I say public enemy number one, I am not exaggerating in the least bit. That's where I thought I was gonna be. Until one day that teacher said, are you God? And I started looking at what God gave me. I was the best boxer in New York. That's how I was going to make my money. Boxer, I was going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. My mother told me, nah, son, you my baby boy. I'm not going to let you box and let him break up your face. <laughs> they ain't happy. Then I said, well, how am I going to make it after that? And the police came to me. The last people in the world I thought would come to me to let me know, hey man, you got a talent. I never knew a talent. But the first talent, the first love, love I had wasn't track and field. It wasn't boxing. It was swimming. I was the best Harlem bathtub swimmer there was. <laughs> Only place I had outside the bathtub, I was swimming the Harlem River, I was swimming the Hudson River. And one day, as a little boy, I heard them make a statement about this woman swimming the English Channel. But I didn't know what the English Channel was, but I knew which woman was. I said, Daddy, why would she swim the English Channel? Did she get a trophy? Did she get money? What did she get? Did she break a record? My father said, well, I don't know. I said, my Daddy, I got a couple more questions. When she swim, does she swim with a knife in her mouth? Does she swim? How did she go to the bathroom? I didn't know they let her out the water do she just didn't drop her back in the water. My father said, he said, why was she swimming a knife in her mouth? I said, well, daddy, are there sharks in the water? <laughs> my father said, Lord, thank you. He said, well, I go and I'll find out, son, and I'll come back. He said, you know, because I swim like a rock straight to the bottom. <laughs> but I'll go find out. In the meantime, when he went to find out, they came back and they said this thing called the Olympic Games. Daddy, what's the Olympic Games? He said, son, that's when all the nations in the world come together to see who's strong of mind and who's strong physically. I said, daddy, I want to go to the Olympic Games. Can I go as a black swimmer? He told me, no. I said, what do you mean, no, daddy, I'm the best. I said, why can't I go? And he did like this, he rubbed on his hand. When he rubbed his hand like that, I thought he was rubbing a bug bite or something. And he was telling me, merely because of the color of my skin, I couldn't go. If I relied on what he said that I couldn't go because of the color of my skin, I would have walked on by the guy that fell out because he couldn't get oxygen. Because I would have been thinking that I wasn't worthy enough because of the color of my skin. I couldn't give him my oxygen because he was a different ethnic background. We can't let this destroy your opportunities in life. Shut up, man, go to your next question. <laughs> <laughs> Well, the, the one thing, one of the reasons that we're here is about the Olympics, and, and so if you can tell us what led up to, to you and Tommy deciding, okay, we're going to do this, and, and a lot of people don't realize that the United States, had, before the 68 Olympics, was thinking about boycotting the Olympics. 
So when they agreed that they weren't going to boycott, then John said, okay, then we're going to do, uh, do what we did. Well, what happened was, <clears throat> we at San Jose State Farm, we had a lot of social issues in America that was brought, that they was headed in the wrong direction. We as athletes felt like we was as powerful as any politician, the president on down as athletes, and it still stands today. You would think that if, uh, if Kaepernick didn't make that statement, if he was just John Doe, not an athlete, would nobody pay attention. So we felt that it was our responsibility to shed the light on the ills of society. Only way we can shed the light and say, hey man, we're willing to step back from something that we all grew up from little tots and want to go to the Olympic Games and represent America. But at the same time, we did our research, we felt that America really, truly wasn't representing us. We said, what do we do for America? When the walls go down, we're out in the front line, we give our lives, we give our blood, and then when we come home, we treat it like second class citizens. We want to resolve this issue once and for all. We want to shed light on that we have a critical situation, we need to come to the table and have dialogue about it. How do you give dialogue is when you send people into shock. You know, oh, now it's time, we got to pay attention. So we said, well, let's boycott the Olympic Games. But in boycotting, you have to have an understanding, a thorough understanding as to why you're doing a boycott. So anyone that feels like I want to make a change in society, I want to stand for this cause or stand for that cause, you can't stand for it if you don't have a thorough knowledge as to what you're standing for. So the first thing we had to do was to go to the library, and we all became librarians. We all became students of the library to go in and research everything. Why do we want to research? Because the first thing the enemy, so to speak, wants to do is put a mic in your face and ask you questions, and you better be prepared. If you say, I'm going to stand for this, or I'm going to stand for that, and they question you about it, and you don't know how to handle the questions, whatever you're standing for, attempting to stand for, is going down the drain. So we went to research thoroughly. And then once we researched, it wasn't about researching the same. We just fully want to have the knowledge ourselves. We need to spread the knowledge amongst the athletes that had the opportunity to go to the games. We sat down, we started making them understand, and a lot of them came back and said, man, you know, we can't get to the point where we are going to just walk away from something that I was our dream from the time we were kids to go to the Olympic Games. <laughs> All my life I wanted to go to the Olympic Games and hey, you putting up a stop sign and tell me, pass up the Olympics. I can't do that. We had made them understand, say, man, this is not for you, this is for your kids what we ask you to do. A lot of them said, no, nah, man, I'm not willing to pass up the Olympic Games. We don't have no right to tell anyone, hey man, you must pass up the game. Here, 50 years later, a lot of them changed their mind. They said, I have a better understanding. But we didn't have no right to tell anyone, man, you have to sacrifice these Olympic games for your kids. They didn't understand that. It's a choice. So we decided, okay, y'all don't want to go, or you do want to go, let's take a vote. But when the vote went down, they decided we wanted to go. I said, I'm not going. I told Kareem, I said, Kareem, I'm not going. I said, you, as far as you, you should go out. I said, what are they going to do? Fire you? I said, you are the history. You're the foundation of the NBA right now. So if you don't know what they're going to do to you. Tell you ain't going to the NBA. So Kareem thought about it. He decided he was going to stay and do his education. I said, I wasn't going to go. But God came to me and he said, you're not Kareem. He said, if you don't know what's going to happen, they're going to find somebody that runs just as good as you, and they're going to go get in your spot, and they're going to get on the victory stand. The question is, both of you think they will represent you the way you need to be represented? Then it was imperative that I make the team. But based on what I was saying politically, there was a lot of people that were in power that didn't like what I was saying politically. So what they tried to do, they tried to rouse me out and run, run the 100 meters. I couldn't run the 100 meters as a result of my political views. Then they tried to knock me out and run them 200 meters. They would take me and put me in lane one. But God was with me. I did my homework and I got there. So now, when they made the vote and everybody decided to go, and I changed my mind, so I'm going, I'm going to make this team. 
When we got to the games, now here's the question is, whether the fact that the boycott was called off, did that resolve the social issues that we had in society? Wasn't anything solved. So we ran our first round, remind you now, in order to get on that stand up there, in order to make any type of statement, we still had to go through the process of elimination with track and field. Imagine, we out there too shame to fight the evils of society, but yet still we had to still mandate our athletic abilities. Because no win, no show. So now we get there, we go by the first round, we go by the second round, I approach Mr. Smith and I told Mr. Smith, I said, Tommy, I'm disenchanted about the fact that the boycott was called off. I would like to make a statement. What's your take on that? He said, I'm with you. When he said that, two things went through my mind. First thing is, he can have it on them. Second thing was, I got to get validation from my old coach. So I go across to the training track over there with Coach Winters' brother. I said, Coach, I said, I got a dilemma here. He said, what's that? I said, man, I want to give that race to Tommy. I said, but I don't want Tommy to think I'm no punk. He used to ask the way after he's talked. I'm going to do something, but I don't want him to think that he's dominant than me. So he said, John, you always been your own man, and you're going to do what you think is right anyway. I said, Coach, that's all I need to hear. The second thing was to go to my home and call my partners across the country and put the word out, don't make no bets on this race, because I don't know what I'm going to do yet. <laughs> A lot of my friends made money over from high school and went up and So now I go back and, and, and I said to Mr. Smith at that time when we had the, the discussion, I said to him, I said, all right, the thing is, what artifacts do we have to bring to the table? He said, he had some gloves. I said, bring them. I had beads. Bring them. He had a black scarf for his neck. Bring them. I had a black shirt to come from my USA uniform. And I'll explain what all that meant in a minute. And then most of all, we had black socks. We had been running our races in black socks. And then we decided that we was going to take the Puma shoe out there. Why? I put that Puma shoe on the victory stand. I put it there because when I was a little kid in high school, and I ran my first track meet, and I went to the Adidas people and asked them for a pair of shoes, and they looked at me and said, man, you ain't nobody. We don't give shoes to people when they did nothing. And I looked at him and said, you made a big mistake. I said, because I'm the baddest. You're going to wish you did give me these shoes. So I got a job with Puma and started pushing the Puma shoes the whole nine yards. So when I put them on the victory stand, it's because Puma was loyal to people that couldn't afford the shoes. They gave to whoever needed shoes. It wasn't about your status in terms of you being a superstar before they gave you shoes. So now, here. The beads that I had on my well, the glove, first of all, the black glove was because it was the first time that the Olympic Games had ever been covered, uh, televised in Technicolor. So we wanted to let them know who we were re representing first. We represented black people of America and of the world. Then we represented America. And why did we have it that way? Because when black people was illustrated in the newspaper or, or television or radio, they illustrated us in a very negative sense. Very negative. Still happens today. But at the same time, it's a lot of good things that black people do too. And going to the Olympic Games was one of them. So we wanted to let them know, you know, we represent the good part of black America right now. So we put the black glove on. Tommy Smith put a black scarf around his neck to illustrate black pride. Proud of who he was, proud of his accomplishments. I had a USA jersey on. And I put a black shirt over it, and they said, why you wear a black shirt? I say, I was ashamed of America because I thought America could do so much better than what it's shown me in my 45 years, or my 23 years at that time. And then we had the black socks on with no shoes. We had the black socks on with no shoes to show the poverty that was going throughout the South. There was a lot of white folks in the South, too, that was going through poverty. But at the same time, almost like they accepted poverty, but black people didn't accept it. And it was always illustrated by how we treated one another, how the dope was running the neighborhood, and it's still that way today. And then we took the Puma shoe and put it out there, of course. I had my uniform jacket open because I thought about my mother and my father in terms of them being blue-collar workers, 
Blue collar workers, just like I illustrated from the beginning, there's no color line there with who's a blue collar worker and who's not a blue collar worker. But those are the foundation of America. But blue collar workers were forgotten soldiers, so to speak. So when I went up on the victory stand, I didn't want to go there suited up with my jacket zipped up and so forth. I left my jacket open in remembrance of my father and my mother and people like them that went to work every day to make this country what it is today. They never give you an opportunity to express this. The medal that they had hanging around our neck, 99% of the people, not in this audience, but in the world, thought that they'd taken our medals away. But they didn't take the medals away. They came to us after the games were over, after we got done with our race anyway, and told us in the hotel lobby, the hotel diplomatica, that, hey, we're going to take your medals away. I stepped up and I told myself, well, first of all, let me just say this. You're going to take my medal away? I don't know about Mr. Smith, but let me tell you about John Collins. The medal has no significant value to me. I said, this medal here is for my kids. If they can't throw it in the river, that's their business. I said, well, relative to you taking it from me? I said, you didn't come knock on my door and tell me, say, John, it's an open slot on the Olympic team. We want to put you on. You set a standard. I had to meet your standard to make it to the trials. Anybody couldn't, you couldn't just walk in and be an Olympic participant. You had to qualify to go to the Olympic trials. Then when you got to the trials, you might have 1,500 guys to run the 100. Out of the 1,500 guys, they're going to take four. And maybe one more as a substitute in case somebody get hurt in the relay. But it's only going to be three per event. So it's a process of elimination. By the grace of God, I made the process of elimination. Then when I got to the Olympic Games, I found out that I had to go through the process of elimination all over again. But now, it's not just the United States, it's the world that I had to compete against. Uh, was blessed again, I made it through that process. And now I'm on the victory stand and I have received my medal and because you don't like my politics or my views, now you tell me you're gonna take my medal away. I have to remind them, you didn't give me this medal, I earned it. And for anyone out here that has a job, go work your job for 30 days and let your smart, somebody come up and tell you, say, I'm gonna take your check back. Hmm. See the attitude that you're gonna have towards that. Bring the militia if you come to get this check. Okay? So, bottom line is, all we were trying to do in this statement up here is to make people become conscious of the society in which we live. And say, how can we make it better for everybody? It's enough money. Why should the one percenters be the ones that have all the money and everybody else have to wish that they had money? We have enough money in this society that everybody should be eating good. I sit back and think about how they, in, the, in the South, how the dairy farmers, they would tell them, they take the milk and throw the milk in the river before giving the people that don't have money, they can't afford to buy milk. Think about what's happening right now in terms of the tariffs that's taking place outside of this country and the tariffs that's being put on the United States relative to what the United States did. You know who's going to be the sacrificial lambs in all of this? You. Me. And a lot of times, instead of us raising our voice to say, I'm disenchanted about what I see, we choose to keep our mouth shut. And you keep your mouth shut, like my father said, a shy man is starved to death. When it's time to speak up, you must speak up. So we went to the Olympic Games, and after the Olympic Games was over, we were shut. When I say we were shut, we were shut in the most critical way. It broke up all my marriages. My first wife took her life. You know, for her to take her life, and then for me to sit there with my kids and have to try and make my kids have an understanding why your mama took her life. And that pains me to talk about it. But yet still, every time I think about it, when the dust settled, I say my life, my wife would have had to take her life a thousand times. But I've never changed what I had to do that day. Because my life, our life, was secondary to making that statement. That was more important than anything on this planet. To make people 50 years, 100 years, 200 years.
40 years down the line, this would be an issue. But in my class, when I was teaching, some kids came to me one day and said, Mr. Collins, Mr. Collins, uh, you can help us. We got a bit going on. I said, what's that? He said, well, we got this new textbook. We looked through the textbook, and we saw this picture, and then we turned back. But we had to turn back because we never seen no picture like that. And we looked. There was three lines under the pictures, and we see his name, John Collins. And I'm telling you, that ain't you. That, that guy's too young to be you. <laughs> I tell him, I said, well, look, man, what y'all need to do is go do some research and then come back and we have some dialogue. Now, I'll show you, if you see a textbook and you see a picture in the textbook, normally they have an overview in terms of what this picture is about. They'll give you some dialogue. But they didn't have any dialogue. All they had was that picture and the three lines underneath it. I'm sure everybody want to know what this is about. I don't want you to have to go to the movies to get a Hollywood story that they put together. Question time. Um, before we do the, we're, I'm going to show the race real quick, and then right after that, Caitlin, if you could show the medal ceremony, just so you, you heard what, what John said. If you haven't seen the race, the 200 meter, and then the medal ceremony. We'll take a look. second, one to silver, um, and I'll let John tell you about that real quick, but um, if you notice, in the race, John wore his human rights button. Well, I had a button on all the time, doing the race, walking down the street, going to dinner, I just wore it on day to day. Uh, but, I, you know, I would like to talk a little bit about Peter Norman. You know, I try and put things in parallel with one another, and I say, who does Peter Norman remind me of? yesterday in history. And Peter Norman and John Brown have a parallel history in my mind. And the history is this. You sit back and you say, well, you know, when I was a kid, I used to hear about John Brown. And by the time I turned 16 years old, leaving uh, middle school, moving up to high school, John Brown disappeared. They ain't talking about John Brown no more. Even to this day, you very seldom hear anything about John Brown. 
And then I said, wow, here's a guy, looked like John Brown, blonde hair, blue eyes, and then they were Peter North. And stood in that victory stand with me. He believed in equality and human rights for all people. And then the parallel was, why did they disobey John Brown's history? And now why did they disobey Peter Norman's history? Because Peter Norman was there, but for, for the better part of 40 years, they cut Peter Norman out of the pictures. Now the question is, why did they cut Peter Norman out of the pictures? Because he's a white guy? Because he's a white guy that believed in humanity? He's a white guy that believed in justice and equality for all people? John Brown fought for the same thing. So they said, man, we can't let white kids grow up and think that white people could be liberal enough to think that, man, we have enough to share around for everyone. We can build this country together. We can roll up our sleeves and get busy to make this a better society. I tried when I was your age. It's time for you to pick up the ball, and you be the next John Brown. You be the next Peter Norman. Peter Norman died about 10 years ago. Peter Norman never turned his back on what we stood for. He never denied what we stood for. He never flinched in the least bit. And don't think that they didn't put pressure on him. They put an enormous amount of pressure on the three of us. I say, you know, what the difference here in the United States and the difference in, in Australia was this. The United States was the United States. Australia and South Africa were parallel in terms of their mind process, in terms of dealing with worse race relations. When you sit back and you think about here in the United States, well, they had two individuals they could jump on. They would say, well, let's beat up on Carlos until we get tired of beating up on him. And they said, well, let's go find Tommy Smith and beat up on him. So when they were beating up on me, Tommy had a rest. When they beat up on Tommy, I got a rest. But Peter Norman and Australia didn't get no rest. 24 7, 365, they beat him down and did everything they could do to break him. He never broke. And wherever he is in this universe, wherever his soul is right now, you can rest assured that Peter Norman is standing strong right now, as strong as John Brown is standing strong for what they believed in. You can't let them erase when someone stands for good. I question them every day. Why did you take Peter Norman off the picture? I didn't take him off the picture. Why is it that every time I want to talk about Peter Norman, you want to change the subject? Because you don't want young white kids to realize that an individual such as themselves can stand up for what's right in the society. You've got to turn your volume up. You've got to be the ones that speak on these issues. I can't speak for you. These are things that you need to speak for. Why? Because remember, everybody in here right now, with the exception of these youngsters down here in the front row, but you guys in the back to some college, you're one step away from being married and a half a step away from starting your family. And when you start your family, you have to realize at one point in your life that the things that you do in life ain't for you no more. Everything you do from that point on is for your kids. Everything that your parents do right here in this front door here for the high school kids, everything your parents do right now, they're doing it for you. All they ask you to do is go to school and not go through school. Why? Because as I said earlier, we can't beat them with guns. We can't beat them with bombs. But we can beat them through knowledge and education. We can beat them through public love and giving names. That's the only way we're going to turn society around. How are we going to have a president go in the White House and then say, man, I want to divide this country into four different areas? Mm -hmm. We can't have that. And if you sit back and you think that I'm making something about the president, think about the chaos that's going on right now. And then not to say this man didn't have done some good things. Yeah, he's done some good things. But for every two good things he did, he did six bad things. You understand? So how can I be excited about what he did good when I see so much bad that's being done to override what he's done good? These are choices that you're going to have to deal with. I had a, a situation when I was in school. I had a white guy with my buddy. He was my partner all through school. Got to our senior year, and he 
come to me and he tell me, Mr. John, he said, I can't be your friend no more. What do you mean you can't be my friend no more? My father told me that I got to break my friendship with you. What do you mean your father told you you got to break your friendship? Why you got to break your friendship with me? My father told me if I want to get a decent job, I can't be associated with you. And I looked at him, I said, why you can't be associated with me? He said, my father said, because you're black. Oh, he didn't say that, but he said, because you're a Negro. And I said to him, I said, all right, man, your father said that, but what did you say? And his attitude was, that's my father. So you know what, I had to come up with a t-shirt. And if on the t-shirt I wrote, no kid is born a racist. Nobody on this planet came in here with bond and had a racist attitude. Racism is something that's employed upon a kid through what he's learning in his household. And if that little girl told me, say, I changed her life in that one day, you have an understanding within yourself that you have the power to make change. I had the power to make people open up their eyes and think for themselves. Well, in 50 years, things seem to water down. But I tell people, I say, would you see the day that these young athletes out there today? I was a gardener on horticulture when I was 23 years old. I tilled the earth, I planted seeds, and I watered it. When I couldn't get to the water, God watered it. And now here we are 50 years later, and you look up and you see these young individual athletes. You think they want to be doing the things that they're doing? You think they want to take a knee? You think they want to sacrifice their jobs? You think they want to be hated? No, they don't want that. But what they want is equality. So now when people ask me about them, I tell them, I say, yeah, man, those individuals are the fruit of my labor. For what I did 50 years ago, when they turned the page, they say, hey, man, somebody did it so we know it's possible that we can make change. I sit back and I think about, you know, Robert Kennedy being assassinated. When they assassinated that man, just by the grace of God, I was walking right by the hotel when they shot him. And I was walking by that hotel with the thought in my mind, where's my life going? I hear the helicopters rolling overhead. I hear the sirens running. I know what was going on. I'm in destitute right now. Where's my life going? How am I going to be able to take care of my kids? Why did my wife take her life? All this is running through my head when they shot this man in the hotel. When I get home, I realize that they shot Robert Kennedy. And even deeper than that, they shot him on my birthday. June 5th was my birthday, or is my birthday. And talk about birthdays, those three men right there, I was born June 5th, 1945. Tommy Smith was born June 6th, 1944. Peter Norman was born June 15th, 1943. Gemini's in the house got the power. <laughs> right? So, yeah, sure. See, he's very passionate about this, and, and that's why I love him so. Uh, who, who impressed you most in your life? My father. My father. My father was. My father was my hero. I mean, there was a lot of heroes out there, but the one that impressed me more was my dad, because everything that I know, my dad taught me, and he taught me about respect. Uh, if anybody ever read my book. You'll see a piece of the book about some trees I burned down. And I burned these trees down for, for a specific reason. The trees are still alive today, I want you to know. But I had to go to court. And when I went to court, my father was telling me, he said, son, I don't think you're going to be coming home with me. I think you're going to send you reform school, this, that, and the other. But when I got to court, I defended myself so well and made it realize that it wasn't me, it was the manager of the project. When he was, had to stifling the spray for caterpillars, he chose to take the money and put it in his pocket. But when I showed them that this man was ripping the city off, the whole nine yards, then I became the hero. So we were walking out down the car to get ready to leave the court building, and my father looked at me, he stopped, and he said, he said, son, I can never express to you 
how proud I am of you. I mean, you feel good with your dad to tell you he's proud of something he did. I wasn't no more than about 14 years old. And we walked a little farther, we was getting ready to go out the door, and he stopped again, and he looked at me, and when he told me this is made my neck, my legs turned to rubber, I almost fell down, he said. He stopped and looked at me, he said to me, he said, son, I respect you so much. And when I look at him, I said, what'd you say, Dad? He said, I respect you so much, sir. I can't tell you how much I respect you. And it made my legs rubber because as a kid, you look to adults and give respect to them. You don't look for your father. Tell me you're proud of me. Yes, I can understand that. But for your dad to look at you at 14 years old and tell you why he respects you, I guess that grew up in me, you know, like a like a tree inside my body, inside my spirit. If my daddy can tell me you respect me for who I am and what I've done in my life, damn well, everybody out there will give me the same respect. That's the bottom line of that. Uh, what kind of mindset did you have, have going into every conversation? Well, to give the people a good show for their money. That was, that was the essence of it. You know, like, I always felt like if you're going to be in something, you need to be a showman in whatever your job is. Now, people pay to get into the track meets, uh, and I always wanted to give them a good show. And a good show wasn't just to hear the gun and run to the tape. A good show was to get up in the stands and talk to the people and clown around with them a little bit and take some pictures with them, eat a little food with them, play with the kids. And then they said, John Collins, will you please come check in for the, for the hundred? And I run all the way from the top of the stage and down the steps. And I hear them say, damn, he's going to be too tired to run when he gets to the finish the stop, right? And then I would jump over the rail. I got a couple of runners that's in here. They see me. They one over there. They go here. They see me run. I would jump over the rail and run down the start line. And when the first question I would say to my competitors, who's taking second today? <laughs> <laughs> so when the person does all the things that I did, and then you jump over the rail and run down to the start line and, and tell somebody, say, somebody say, because what you going to do today? And I look at him and I said, man, did you pay your money? Oh, I paid my money. I said, well, sit yourself down because I got a show for you. And then I go on and give him a good show. Some guy would talk a whole bunch of smacks. So I said, I'm with you. I said, well, I tell you what, you got a cute girlfriend. Why don't you bed up? And I know what I'm going to do. So, you know, so it's, it's always giving a good show for money. That's, that's what I thought every time. In fact, when I was at San Jose State, I had a uh, couple of lunches with, with John and Tommy Smith and some of these world class uh, runners and I asked them, you know, talk about going to different meets and they said, and of course, they, a lot of them ran different races and so forth and they said when they would go to a track meet, the first thing they would do is go up to the officials and say, what's the record in the 800, what's the record in the 400, what's the record in the 100 of this meet? <laughs> because we're going to break it. <laughs> and they did many times. Uh, next question, uh, do you support what Colin Kaepernick is doing? Oh, 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 see, a lot of people confused about what Colin Kaepernick is doing, and I think 40, 40, 45 is one that got everybody confused. You know, Colin Kaepernick says, I'm taking a seat, or I'm taking a knee, I think he did both. Uh, and he said, I'm doing this based on the fact that there's police brutality going on. Now, I got police law enforcement in my family. My, my grandson is a Philadelphia police. Bottom line is this, it's a lot of police and all people that work on the job and have necessary rights as people. They got some rogue police. They go in and kill and they got the cold blue, the cold of color. No matter what go down in this cold, I got to turn my head, I got to keep my, my lips shut. So when there's someone is killed in the hood and it's unjustifiable homicide because you wear that badge, if you kill somebody and you have the line to kill them, you're supposed to be prosecuted. They don't prosecute the police. They walk away. And those that they attempt to prosecute, they still walk away. When you shoot a little kid in the park playing with a cap gun, and you ain't in the park no more than 15 seconds, and you pull out a gun and shoot a little kid, or where else are the kids supposed to play with a cap gun but in the park? Shoot him dead. Police go in another house, here's a woman sitting on the sofa with her daughter, they bust the door, they bust the wrong door, kill the little girl. Oh, we sorry, but that didn't bring the little girl back. 
And there was a young lady, she got walking, ticket, taken to jail, and she done, she done hung herself in the jail. I ain't mind. And it's almost like, you know, what happened in the civil rights era when they took those three civil rights workers and, and they hung them and then they took them and threw them in the open and the, the lake down there and put anchors on them and weigh them down. All them little girls they had blown up in the church down there in Alabama. And then they say, well, we're going to prosecute the individuals that did this. And when they prosecute them, they prosecute them 70 years later. They have lived from the time they was in the 20s when they did this, now they're in the 90s, and they tell me that justice has been served because they went back and prosecuted these individuals. They have lived their life. And then I'm supposed to be satisfied. I can't be satisfied with that. I have to raise my voice. I don't care who it is. I don't care what your color is. If you're being wrong, I'm going to step up. But even within that, I have certain situations where I was telling Chuck this morning, when my first kid was getting ready to be born, I went to the grocery store the night before my wife went into labor. The night, night before that happened was when they had the first blackout in New York. I go to the store, and as I'm walking to the store, I see four white kids. And they knocked one of the white kids on the ground, they kicking him, kicking him, stomping on him. So I run over the man, I start throwing him off, and I hear somebody say, you know what, you mind your own business. And who do you think said that? The interview that had his butt on the ground and they were stomping on him. So I was really confused about it even here, 50 some odd years later, I'm still confused about it. How are you being stomped on? And here an individual come up to try and rescue you, and you call him out of his name and tell him to mind his business. So I kind of backed away and I said, well, retardation strikes everywhere. Yeah. You know, so I told him, I said, man, you know, you're right with me. And then the other three, they got the huffing. And I looked at them, oh, y'all want to huff, y'all want to fight? I'm, I'm, I'm a fighter, let's fight. So they backed away. But when I came out of the store, they were gone. But that here, yeah, that's, like I said, that started 60 years ago, and it's still running through my brain right now. How can people be that callous? Next question is, uh, why did you decide to hold up a fist during the ceremony as opposed to doing something else? Why did you decide to hold up a fist? Very good question. Let me say this. There's five people. They can be from every ethnic group. Just like we are in this auditorium. But we're five individuals, and all of us in this auditorium individually say, if I can move this devil from this side to that side over there, I can make a tremendous difference in society for the better. And one of us jumped down out of the fire and get down there and he's trying and he's trying and he's trying, but he can't move. And the second one says, man, you know, you gotta put your hips into it. Let me show you what you didn't do right. And he tries and he tries and he can't do it. But by the time the second one gets done, all of them realize, say, man, you know, if we were to come together, then we become a very powerful force. That's what the fish was all about. Unification. You know, I said each one, teach one. You know, we are one. We just have to realize that. Well, we can do far more with our minds together than we can ever do anything apart. The follow-up on the same one is, uh, and I'll kind of paraphrase here, when you went back to San Jose State after the Olympics, how were your college peers and how were you received uh, at the campus and were there further protests on the campus? Well, first thing, when I got back to my house, to the house that I was renting, I had two white guys I, I lived upstairs over here. And, you know, there was so much chaos going on. When I got home, they had taken a sheet and they put it outside their window. And they said, John Carlos, our brother, welcome home. I can never express to you how much that raised me up just to see that. And here it is, 50 years later, 60, well, 60, 52 years later, I was just with uh, one of my neighbors upstairs working for the State Department for the last 40 years, and we were together, and he showed me the pictures. So that was a great welcome there. Relative to what was happening on the campus, San Jose State was probably one of the most revolutionized uh, campuses in the country. You know, we had a vision, we had a paradigm, 
and we weren't going to let anyone deter us from who we were. From the president on down, we had Dr. Clark, and Dr. Clark was with us 1,000%. Uh, even when you sit back and think about Peyton Jordan, he was the head coach of the team in 68. He was the head track coach for Stanford University. And Peyton Jordan supported us 1,000%, and they told Peyton that, man, you should have been there to discipline those guys. You should have told them that they couldn't do it. And Peyton Jordan told him so politely, he said to him, he said, my job is not to discipline them because they didn't do anything wrong. My job was to see that they came here and did the job at hand to win these races and represent America. And they did, did an absolute job doing that. So you need to step to the side and come to me and tell me about I need to ridicule them for them stepping up and playing as men. See, individuals such as that, I have to respect for eternity. He didn't have to say anything. He could have just kept his mouth shut. And he chose to let them know that you're wrong in coming to me to tell me that I should penalize these individuals. We've got time for one more question. Okay. Because I've got one last question. Uh, oh, what were your parents' reaction to the protest? Well, it's a good question, too. <laughs> My dad was in the hospital getting ready to die. Okay? And incidentally, let me just say this. My mother and father never saw me run a race in TV, on TV, or in person. Okay? Never. Not one. My father used to always be in the shop working with shoes, and people would come in and tell him, say, son, this guy's your son, he's, he's, he's a terror on that track. Or I would come home and win medals, and I'd say, yeah, Papa, here's a medal for you, here's a gift. They never saw me run. Uh, I had two instances. When I came home, you know, instantaneously, when we made the demonstration, the American flag went up everywhere. Prior to that, no, there was no patriotism, none of that. But after we made that demonstration, they would have a pendant that you put on your cloak with an American flag. If you bought a house inside the window, coming in the door with an American flag. Uh, black people that took you to them said, man, now you got a job in the corporate office, and you were the as soon as you got off the elevator, you saw a black face. So a lot of things was transpiring at that time. And when I came home and I saw my mother, and my mother had a coat on, and she had the American flag on the coat. And I was like distraught because America was the one that was land passing. So I told my mother, I said, Mom, come on, let me take you downtown. I need to buy you a coat. And my mother looked at me, no, nothing wrong with my coat. No, Mom, it's an old coat. Let me take you and get you a new coat. And I took her down there to buy this coat, not because she needed a new coat, because I was in flame that she had the flag on her coat. Not until later on down the line when my mother had, I had an opportunity to sit down and have some dialogue with me that she fully understand who I was and what I was doing and why I made the statement. Now my father's in the hospital getting ready to die. My father comes to me and he says to me, he says, son, why did you do all those bad things? And I looked at my father and said, what are you talking about, father? He said, go look at that drawer over there in the hospital. They're looking at the drawers of the New York Times. Now, it said, John Carlos Neighborhood Bunk. That was in the headlines. But 30 days prior to that, that same newspaper said, John Carlos Neighborhood Hero because I represented America and I broke the world record. So I said to my father, I said, Pop, what do you mean bad things? What do you do? So I read the article. And then I says, oh, Papa, let me ask you a couple of questions. Maybe we can get to the bottom of this. I said, do you know H. Rap Brown? He said, no. You know Stokely Carl Michael? No. And if you hear these numbers, look them up and see who these people are. <laughs> do you know Professor Harry Edwards? No. Do you know Tommy Smith? No. Do you know John Carlos? He said, come on, son. I said, no, Papa. Do you know John Carlos? He said, you my baby boy. I said, absolutely, Papa. I said, the same thing that they said about the other people that I mentioned, if you realize what they say the same thing about me. Nobody on planet Earth know me better than you. Is that me that they're writing about? My father just started crying. I started crying. And while I'm hugging my father, we both crying. The first thing ran through my mind, I said, my God, if they could get my father to believe something just based on a headline, my daddy, God help me, what did the rest of the grassroots people think? Because they trained us here in America 
to make our opinion based on what their headlines are. We don't sit back and evaluate it ourselves. If they say John Collins walked the water, and I say to him, no man, I didn't walk the water. Yes, you did. No man, I didn't. Who makes you think I walked the water? Well, the New York Times said you walked the water. Man, I didn't walk the water. Well, hold on. Let me call my brother out in California and see what the LA Times said. So in other words, I'm the subject matter, but they're not paying attention to me as the subject matter. They're going to pay attention to what the headline says. Think for yourself. I've got one last question because these kids are going to need to get on a bus uh, real quick. But I, I would be remiss if you didn't tell them quickly the story of when you met Dr. Martin Luther King, who called John to his hotel to visit with him about the Olympics and, and the possible protest at the weekend. Actually, he called, he called Professor Edwards, or he talked to Professor Harry Edwards. And Harry called my, my house. I was back in New York. I left East Texas State University. And I was helping my mother paint the kitchen. And uh, my mom says to me, he says, John, this is Professor Edward would like to talk to you. So I get on the phone and he says, he says John, it's Harry. It's a very important meeting taking place I'm here in the city, and people ask me to invite you. So I said to my son, man, I'm with. I said, but let me talk to my mother. I said, Mom, they told me it's a meeting and they'd like to have me there. She said, well, if they need you there, you need to be there. Don't worry about this. So I get up and I go down to the hotel. It used to be across the street from the old garden called the Americana Hotel. And I go down there and I'm looking at the hotel. And my mother was like a perfectionist. She likes furniture and nice things. And I walk in the hotel. And as long as I grew up in New York, I only been in two hotels when I was a kid, ever walked through the doors. And I walk in this hotel and I'm looking and I'm seeing this big, beautiful chandelier and mirror and so And I'm saying, man, I can get that for my mother. So I think about all this to take off. And then I snapped out of it. And I went to the desk and asked him, I said, I'm looking for SCLC. I didn't know what SCLC was, Southern Christian Leadership. So I went there and knocked on the door, but I knocked on the door, and a guy called the door, and I'm looking at him, and it blew me away because I'm saying, that's him, but it can't be him. But it is him, but it ain't him. My mind was back and forth, and the guy that opened the door was Dr. Andrew Young. Now, I said it's him, but it can't be him because I thought Dr. Young was like six feet four. But when I saw Dr. Young, no disrespect, he looked like he was four feet six. <laughs> and I'm saying to myself, in my mind, God, the photographer must have been on his back shooting off. <laughs> so anyway, I got by that. He invited me, a very nice man, real cordial, bought me coffee, soda, sandwich, whatever. And I'm sitting there, I'm watching all these luminaries, you know I say, because all these people were with Dr. King, and they walk around in the room, and I'm feeling uncomfortable, like, what am I doing here? I'm not supposed to be here. And about 25 minutes later, the side door opened, and Dr. King walks out into the room. Now, my lip dropped into my lap, and I'm like petrified, boy, that's what I turned into. Like, my God, these days. And I'm saying to myself, boy, my mother needs to be here. She needs to be able to my lapel or rock in my pocket. She needs to be here. <laughs> and when it came out, Dr. King could see, I guess, that I was a little nervous. And he went into a comedian type thing. He started cracking jokes. And he kind of relaxed me. And the essence of the meeting was that he felt that what we were attempting to do with the Olympic boycott was a very powerful way to make a statement, and even greater, he felt it was such a non-violent statement. So he said that he wanted to come and lend his support. He didn't want to be in the number one slot. He thought that Professor Edwards was doing a great job, but he wanted to be second in command. So through the course of the meeting, he makes a statement about, they sent a letter to him, and they told him this letter, they have a bullet with his name on it, and he wanted to have to wait long. So at the end of the meeting, he asked, would I have any questions? Yes, Dr. King, I have two questions. First question was, do you ever play any sports? And he laughed and he said, I can't shoot pool. <laughs> so I said to him, I said, well, Dr. King, why would you get involved in the, the Olympic boycott? He said to me, he said, listen, he said, just imagine you get in a rowboat and you roll out to the center of this big lake. He said, and you have a rock inside, you lay the oars down, you pick this rock up and you put it in your lap, and you just sit there until everything is still and serene in the lake. He 
He said, you take that rock and you throw that rock overboard when everything is still. He said, what happened? I said, it creates vibrations. He said, absolutely, it creates weight. He said, that rock that you threw in the water is down to the big boy guy. He said, when you drop that rock, everything in that lake knew something was amiss. He said, everything on the shores of that lake knew something was amiss. You got the world's attention and you didn't kill, shoot, maim, or harm anyone to make a public statement. That was like that nugget that he gave me. I put in that basket. That was a powerful answer. And then I was so excited about that, I forgot that I had two questions. He said, John, you said you had a second question. I said, oh yeah, Dr. King, I was blown away by what he said in the first one. And then I said to him, I said, Dr. King, you said they sent you a letter and they had a bullet with your name when you went in the way. Now, I used to wear black horn rim glasses like these, but they didn't dial at the time. And it was black. So I took the glasses and put them down on my nose. Because I wanted to look at his eyeballs to my eyeballs. There was nothing between. And you can pretty much surmise what I was looking for. What you think I was looking for, man? You, yeah. Right. What you think I was looking for in his eyes? Fear. Fear. A man tell you that they tell you they're gonna kill you and you have to wait, you just want to see him be a little shaky. But Dr. King was solid as a rock. And all I could see coming from his eyes was love for humanity. But the big thing was, he said to me, he said, John, he said, yeah, they threatened to take my life. He said, but you see what I've accomplished in my life while I'm alive and walking? I said, yes, sir. He said to me, he said, this is nothing to what I will be if they take my life. They can take my life, but they'll never take me who I am. And it's still true today. As powerful as Dr. King was when he walked his earth, he's even more powerful than he's been dead for 50 years, Dr. So it was a monumental opportunity for me. And when I went to Mexico City, what you see in that demonstration, everything that I've learned from him in those two questions helped me formulate how I want to make a demonstration. Because he said to me, he said, John, he said, the statement that you guys will make will vibrate to the far ends of the earth. Just like what he's done, vibrating to the far ends of the earth. Said so once it's done, you can't take it back. So anybody that think that they need to make a demonstration for anything, remember that they always say to me, well, why don't you do it at the Olympic Games? Why not the Olympic Games? You think I should have did it in front of the Apollo? <laughs> so I don't think I would have got the attention out of the Apollo. But any demonstration is like a beacon for society. Why is it a beacon for society? Because the girls that we have here in, in the United States, there's people on the other side of the world have girls as this and greater. But they're looking for someone to show that there's a blueprint in terms of how we deal with these issues. That's what that is, a blueprint. And it gives people courage conviction to say, I'm on the right trail. I'd like to end by saying, God bless you guys. I hope God keep you guys. And I hope you all got something out of this. Thank you for having me.